Welcome to tonight's lecture, which is part of the um, CCSA talk series. But um, tonight it's co-hosted by the research cluster Architectures of Order. And before I am introducing tonight's speaker, Jana Pinera, I want to say a few words about both the CCSA and Architectures of Order. Um, so the CCSA, the Center of Critical Studies in Architecture, is a collaboration between a growing number of scholars located at an equally growing number of institutions. And that include the Goethe University of Frankfurt, the TU Darmstadt, um, and the Deutsches Architekturmuseum, um, the German Museum for Architecture, but also Kassel University and the University of Heidelberg. Um, the CCSA talks were conceived as a platform for its members to present recent and ongoing research projects, but also new publications. And as mentioned, tonight's event is co-hosted by the Research Cluster Architectures of Order, an interdisciplinary four-year research collaboration between researchers from Goethe University and TU Darmstadt and the Deutsche Architekturmuseum and the Max Planck Institute for European Legal History are um, associated partners. So there is some overlap um, between the CCSA members and the Architectures of Order um, group, so it makes perfect sense to combine our efforts for tonight. And part of the Architectures of Order project is a fellowship scheme, which funds a stay of up to three months for two scholars per year who join the team and whose research aligns with the project's changing annual research theme, which this year was designing order. And Jana was one of this year's fellows. And I'm looking very much forward to hearing more about the results of her fellowship research and um, her lecture's title is The Housing Questions is a feminine, uh, Feminist Question, Housing Commons for the New Woman of, um, of the German Bergbund. And because I know that Jana will also talk about how this project sits within her greater research activities and interests, I will not go into much detail in this respect and will just introduce her really briefly before I hand over to her. So Jana is an architect, a researcher, and an educator with a PhD in architecture by design from the AA in London. Um, she also holds a diploma in architectural engineering from Aristotle, uh, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and a postgraduate specialization in architectural design from the University of Thessaly. And her research focuses on neoliberalism and the housing question and intersects architecture and urban planning with economic philosophy, housing policy, and the critical theory of the urban commons. In her fellowship research, she investigated the introduction of feminist thinking in collective housing experiments in the early 20th century Weimar Republic, focusing on two specific case studies, both from the first half of the 1910s, the House der Frau, or the Women's House, a building designed by Margarete knüppelholz röser um, for the 1914 Bergbund exhibition in Cologne, and the Haus der Sonne, the House in the Sun, designed by Emilia Winkelmann, um, located in Potsdam, a residential home for single working women. And one central question for her is the radicality of these projects. And with this, I hand over to Jona and look forward to hearing what you found out. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much for this introduction. Um, and hello, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay, great. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, um, I'm, I'm very happy to present the research that I undertook as a fellow of the Architectures of Order cluster entitled The Housing Question is a Feminist Question, Housing Commons for the New Woman of the German Bergbund. This research operates at the intersection of feminist studies, architectural history, and the commons discourse as a way to contribute to discussing and conceptualizing non-hierarchical um, orders of collective living. So first, I would like to shortly describe how this project sits within my um, research interests. The commons discourse is the umbrella under which my research and teaching at the AA uh, was carried out. And the discourse, of course, is not new, but there is a currently developing field around it as a political, social, and spatial response to a critique of capitalism. 
and particularly the predicament of contemporary housing we, with which my PhD research is concerned. My PhD thesis is entitled, We Have Never Been Private, The Housing Project in Neoliberal Europe, puts forward a critique to the privileged ex exclusionary individualized notion of the private in neoliberal housing, um, both as an institutional and a typological issue. Accompanied by a design project for a community settlement in Athens, it relocates domestic privacy within practices of sharing and the design of the urban housing commons. This year, I started researching housing commons as an enabling framework for a feminist critique. I employ the theoretical framing of feminism by Silvia Federici and Maria Mies that recognizes the capitalist and patriarchal oppression of women through the burden of reproductive labor in the mass produced nuclear family apartment type of the 20th century. So um, Silvia Federici and Maria Mies, they support the liberation of women through collective living forms. Within this framework um, of commons uh, for a, a feminist theory and critique, this year I have published research that highlights unacknowledged contributions of women in the shaping of the ethics of cooperative living, both as designers and as residents, and how the design and practice of, of the commons can redefine accessibility, but also equality in urban living. So this fellowship project uh, um, investigates the feminist struggle for commons in the context of the emergence of the new woman in the Weimar Republic at the beginning of the 20th century. My methodology includes both a historical and a typological reading, which unveils processes of women organizing in collective social movements and generating collective domestic organizations to support their emancipation against the patriarchal status quo of the time. More specifically, I investigate two collective living models designed by women in the 1910s, where I trace the radical ways in which claims and demands for a feminist order entered design processes and a formal movement, the Werkbund, um, which um, both were concerned with modern housing. The link between the emergence of feminist struggles and women's housing initiatives in the Weimar Republic at the turn of the 20th century is accurately documented by Ulla Terlinden and Susanna von Orten as they write. The development of new forms of living, women's cooperatives, student dormitories, one or two room apartments for single women, manifested a gradually changing image of women, a life beyond rigid family and kinship structures made conceivable. As early as 1910, um, women throughout Europe and in Germany were demonstrating for equal rights. In Germany, it was in 1919 when Article 109 of the Weimar Constitution stated that men and women have the same fundamental rights and duties as citizens, including the right to vote and to hold office. By that time, the position of women in the workforce had changed and they began to take new jobs, new kinds of jobs that had previously been dominated by men. All in all, more than 11 million women were employed in Germany by 1918, accounting for 36% of the workforce in total. This became possible by the first generations of women admitted to higher education and granted uh, the right to um, have license to practice. And this was an achievement accomplished through the claims of the women's movement, which took on the character of a pedagogical reform as well. The working women's movement supported the change in position of women in society by promoting themes linked to all women's life, das gesamte Frauenleben, within a new social, professional, and living culture. Emily Winkelmann, the first registered freelance woman architect in Germany who designed one of my two case studies, writes in her article, The Woman Architect and Engineer in 1913 about the challenges of the first women architects. And I, I quote, 
In architecture and engineering, women have the same study opportunities as men. Only in the profession, state careers are close to them at the moment, so that they are dependent on private employment or self-employment. Anyone who thinks of becoming an independent architect, that is, accepting commissions and carrying them out under their own responsibility, should be trained to reliably relieve their boss from the practical and highly undesirable tasks of drafting, estimating costs, and managing construction. Only a completely reliable personality will receive private commissions, which as a woman in the architectural profession is still an exception. And this is what she can largely rely on rather than winning the competition in which, as in all subjects, chances are low due to great supply. And here is um, something that I found interesting as a parallel uh, between the brand that is advertised and the woman advertising it, uh, because they should both be, as the, the, the motto says, uh, technically uh, highly accomplished and absolutely reliable. The challenges in the workplace were addressed along with the housing question from within the feminist quest for emancipation. Women who, by choice or necessity, led single and professional lifestyles could not anymore fit in the two domestic models available to them, the paternal or the marital home, and required new typologies of living. Following the example of the English working girls clubs and women's settlements, in the first years of the movement, homes were founded that offered home economics and shoeing lessons with the aim to increase the training of the women workers so that they could free themselves from their helplessness, helplessness and the confines of the home. A wealth of feminist newspapers emerged at the time and published themes such as housing need and land and housing reform, centralized housekeeping and living standards institutional residences and housing inspection, women architects and housing projects for women. All these press initiatives were supported by the Federation of German Women's Associations until its dissolution in 1933. And we can see in this um, graph uh, that most publication periods end towards this year, 1933, because of the political situation. This, uh, uh, these uh, newspapers advertised jobs for women and housing for single women at different life phases, young, mature, and aging. So from student dormitories to cooperatives for working women and retirement homes, which produced an intoxicating sense of freedom in the big cities for intellectual and professional women. Psychologist Alice Rule Gerstel observed, Women began to cut an entirely new figure, a new economic figure who went out into public economic life as an independent worker or wage earner, entering the free market that had up until then been free only for men. A new political figure who appeared in the parties and parliaments at demonstrations and gatherings. A new physical figure who not only cut her hair and shortened her skirts, but began to emancipate herself altogether from the physical limitations of being female. Finally, a new intellectual psychological figure who fought her way out of the fog of sentimental ideologies and strove toward a clear objective knowledge of the world and the self. The morality of this new woman against the sanctity of marriage and motherhood was at the heart of German debates, not only about social stability and national identity, but also about modern aesthetics. The female claims to cultural authority and professional practice formed a kind of agency that affected the Werkbund during the organization's formative years, uh, from its founding in 1907 to its major design exhibition of 1914 in Cologne. During this period, the Werkbund, an association of artists, architects, entrepreneurs, and craftsmen, identifying as a cultural and aesthetic reform movement, became entangled with these changes in gender roles in order to address a new discourse on living culture, von Kultur. And they promoted within this framework, uh, workers' apartments and cooperatives. 
the voices of women in their quest for self-agency in the aesthetic creation of this new living culture were more and more expressed in exhibitions, fairs, conferences, and publications. Of course, they were not always wel welcomed by formal and heavily male-dominated circles. In fact, the Verkund ideology was initially born out of the need to save the German culture from the Brika Brack. The Brika Brack was an arts fair held in the Berlin Secession Gallery by the Women's Employment Association, an organization that promoted economic opportunities for working women. Despite its intimacy and coziness, the excess heterogeneity and disorder in the display of the exhibits were considered by many in design reform circles to be typically feminine vices that had no place in a formal style. Female contributions to the design of a new living culture were also pioneered and advocated at the 1912 monumental women's exhibition called Women at Home and at Work. Organized by the Lyceum Club in Berlin, an organization made up only of academic and professional women architects. Gertrude Boimer, who was director of the Federation of German Women's Associations that year, highlighted in the journal Die Frau, the domestic interior designs displayed at the exhibition as a public statement about a new professional relationship between women and the home, uh, where education in all branches of women's work was central. The aim was to stress women's determination to strive for a deep and fundamental knowledge to foster efficiency, clarity, and truth as Rose Senshi Hale wrote at Die Welt der Frau in 1912. These claims contributed to shaping the Verkund's central design principles of quality and objectivity, which culminated at the Verkund exhibition of 1914 in Cologne. Within the exhibition's original intention to act as a showcase of the products of German art industries, Women architects and artists envisioned their role as creators of a new aesthetic culture of the everyday life that combined design reform theories with the applied arts and claims the claims of the women's movement. This new understanding I have attempted to examine closely in my two case studies, the house of the woman and the house in the sun, both realized in 1914, through their historical and typological reading, I aim to explore the capacity of these early architectures of the Verbund to challenge the role of women in society through a social and spatial reconfiguration of housing. Despina Stratigakos, researcher of the female question in the Weimar Republic, argues that the range of housing alternatives for single women started decreasing already from 1913 onwards to 1932. So this made me want to inquire this early experimentation period of the first half of the 1910s, before housing became again prototyped according to the nuclear family apartment type and mass produced in the industry. So these experiments were very short lived. My first case study, the house of the woman at the Verkund exhibition of 1914 in Cologne was intended as a showcase of the achievements of its female members in the applied arts. Particular focus was placed in the exclusive authorship of women from con conceptual origin to the manual labor of artistic production as a way to establish their position as intellectual creators, which was considered until then a masculine domain. Indicative of the role of women in the design reform movement is the location of their pavilion in the urban layout of the exhibition. It was placed in a square attached to the main hall square at the end of the main exhibition route. This smaller square was also framed by the entries of leading Bergkund figures, Walter Gropius's factory administration building, Henry van de Velte's theater, and Peter Behrens's festival hall. According to the exhibition's retrospective review, Deutsche Werkkunst in 1916, I quote, the area between the theater, the factory and the house of the woman is probably the best spot in the exhibition seat. Additionally, a perspective opened up from the Gropius buildings to the lower Rhine village through a pedestrian street running parallel to the house of the woman, 
and revealing gradually its rear garden terrace overlooking the Rhine as part of the design of the embankment which constituted the facade of the exhibition city from across the river. The official catalog of the exhibition stated that it is the first time that a spatial house is made available to women at an exhibition and only to women working in the arts and crafts field. And that this should be only a milestone in the development of this female profession, which has only existed for a few decades. A special journal issue on arts and crafts for the housing culture stated that it is a testament to the high esteem in which women's work is held, that within this very demanding framework, a house of, of their own is made available to them, a house built according to a woman's design. This woman was Margarete Knuppelholz Rosa, an architect and artist trained in Magdeburg, Stuttgart, and Breslau, and practicing in Berlin, who received the first prize in a competition open to German and Austrian women architects for the design of this pavilion. There, were also, there was also an organizing committee consisting of Anna Mutesius as director, Else Opla Legman as executive director, and Lili Reich as general secretary. Their backgrounds in fashion and costume design, interior architecture and decoration contributed to the Werkbund as a reform movement on all aspects of everyday life. The stark physical appearance of the House of the Woman signaled this new female discipline, embodying, of course, the Werkbund's guiding principles, strict objectivity, precise treatment of the material and beauty in the forms of expression. The pavilion was a low tripartite structure characterized by serene horizontality, clear articulation of rectilinear forms and symmetry. From the front, a striking feature was the total absence of windows, ornamentation and rounded elements, except for the friezes of the gates in blue ceramic tile and the trees. This exterior austerity was a statement against derogatory gender assumptions for women's nature as prone to decorations and ornaments that were considered household junk. It was therefore a statement on the role of women in modern society as read the slogan on the frieze above the entrance. At the same time, the building's classicizing exterior design entirely determined by the internal layout was a tribute to a modern and timeless functionalism, which addressed the needs of modern women. So one could say that this type stood as the Verkman's representation of social and domestic restructuring, a symbol of continuity and progress combined. Against the social order centered at the woman's reproductive role in the family, this 30 room building celebrated the display of practicing women's life and works, a modern feminine living culture, which according to the official catalog, and I quote, complements the strict objectivity of the woman's house with the art of hospitality, artistic events with traditional domestic practice, extrapolated on a collective scale. Visitors entered through an entrance hall, which acted as the entry point to a circuit of variously sized rectilinear exhibition rooms structured around a central core. At the center of this core was a large square room designed by Opla Legman, which opened up on the left to a tea room and on the right to a theater stage and was intended for social functions, shows and performances organized by a special committee of women from Cologne. Men who wrote reviews of the exhibition at the time were surprised to see in the central space and I quote again, instead of areas traditionally occupied by women like fashion and decoration, another area conspicuously developed with a relatively large number of living, sleeping and reading rooms designed by women. Among the few surviving image of this um, domestic interiors is one of a library designed by Alexe Altenkir, a Cologne based artist and one of a dining room designed by Anna-Marie Moldenhauer, a designer from Offenbach. 
They reveal the conviction of women to design domestic interiors according to the modernist aesthetics. And as the official catalog states, it is precisely here that it should be shown that women know how to make living spaces comfortable. And I should add to that collective living spaces for energetic women uh, who challenge social conventions by pursuing higher education and professional careers. The exhibition rooms, which Opla Legman called the purely practical section, were arranged around this active social core. Items displayed were classified according to gender and exhibited women's design and craftsmanship in interior decoration and scenography, plastic art and ceramics, applied graphics, tapestry, embroidery, clothing, painting, photography, poster art and advertising work, drawing um, and handwork in schools, basketry and toys, jewelry and metal, and even architecture models. Thus, a broad panorama of women's artistic production surrounded a hub of collective life at the center of the pavilion. Opla Legman highlighted that each department should act not as an austere exhibition object, but rather as a space formed with love and care, so that the true female gift to animate space and make livable is expressed. True femininity, that is the general motto for the whole undertaking. This true femininity was presented as a balance between two complementary qualities, objectivity and professionalism in artistic creation on the one hand, comfort and hospitality in domestic living on the other. Each was posited as integral to the other in the creation of the modern home, but also the creation of the role of the woman in it. And that is why the House of the Woman exemplified the Bergbund's conception of living culture. Um, and this, this was a sculpture um, placed in the rear garden uh, of the pavilion. My second case study, The House in the Sun, was designed in 1913 and built in 1914 by Emily Winkelmann, who is considered the first freelance woman architect in Germany, although she didn't manage to officially finish her higher education at Hanover's Technical College. Uh, and that is because it was the decade before women were permitted to study. It was the first decade of the 20th century. So she, it was even quite uh, illegitimate for her to enter in the first place. She, uh, nevertheless, she had been running a successful office in Berlin since 1907, which was the first architectural firm owned by a woman and employing female architects. By the time that this project was built, she employed 15 uh, women junior architects. Her firm gradually built a reputation from a broad spectrum of realized projects, on the one hand, private villas and cottages in the country house style of the time, which was influenced by Herman Mutesius. On the other hand, public programs such as a theater, a hospital, and a girls' school in Aachen. Winkelmann's conscious involvement in commissions by women's organizations started in 1912, when she presented over 30 of her projects at the section Women in Architecture of the exhibition, The Woman at Home and at Work in Berlin. The German Lyceum Women's Club that organized it, as we saw earlier, had set itself the task of involving women in projects as part of a social policy. As a member of the Lyceum Club, Winkelmann started taking up projects initiated by the German women's associations that introduced radical new types of architecture to represent women's changing lifestyles and their presence in urban life. And among these types was housing for single working women and accommodation for retired women. In 1914, Bickelman was established as one of the leading designers of the women's movement with three housing designs she submitted the same year. One won the third prize in the competition for the House of the Woman at the Verkund exhibition in Cologne that we saw earlier. 
The second one won the first prize and was actually built uh, for the House of the Woman at the International Book and Graphic Arts Exhibition in Leipzig, for which she also received a gold medal. And the third one was the House in the Sun, an architectural and socio-historical monument to the homonymous women's movement, inspired by, again, a homonymous, very influential novel by Carl Larsson, a Swedish author. The construction and administration of the building was provided by the Cooperative for Women's Homesteads, founded in 1912 by the Pestalozzi Frobel House, a school that had been training women for professional careers since the 1870s. The cooperative was modeled according to the precedent of a female teacher's retirement home in Pankow, which was considered an indisputable success in responding to a housing need for single women as social policy rather than charity. Oops, here. The Cooperative for Women's Homesteads gradually acquired two acres in Neu Babelsberg Novavas in Potsdam, Berlin, from the Association for Official Homes, and built the first house in 1914, dedicated, and I quote, to providing healthy, pleasant, and inexpensive dwellings for educated, working, or retired single women. The opening lines of this article about the project capture its essence. What more could one wish than a quiet, comfortable home for the working woman, who often has to work from dawn to dusk and has no close relatives with whom to unite in shared domesticity? And yet she cannot do it so easily, even when she has grown old and wants to retire from the hustle of her busy life. It is difficult for her to live comfortably with limited means and to maintain a certain degree of independence without being doomed to complete loneliness. Winkelmann had been involved from the earliest stages of the cooperative, participating in the working committee that devised the initial plans. The domestic model for the cooperative's idea of a genuine rather than an institutional home was the villa. The selection of a site in a green suburb close to Berlin, which was to be reached by a short train ride, was aimed at occupants who wished to conclude the autumn of their life in tranquility and comfort, but at the same time have hardly given up on life and can easily reach the city. This claim required Winkelmann's design to accommodate all sorts of contrasts, a modernizing classicism and a comfort in vernacular, an urban type and a countryside formal style, the proximity to the city and the natural surroundings of the suburb. On the one hand, the building demonstrated an almost completely unadorned exterior with simple forms and masses producing uh, a monumentality accentuated even by Doric pillars uh, framing the loggia windows. At the same time, this classicism was tempered by vernacular elements of domesticity and tradition, the facades modulating planes and varying roof lines, the red tiled pitched roofs, flower boxes and window shutters, pergolas and fencing. There were 14 apartments on three floors with one to three rooms. Each one had its own entrance hall, kitchenette, loggia and toilet. The largest units were equipped with baths, while the others shared a bathroom located on each floor. In line with its modern inhabitants, the house boasted the latest conveniences that most Berliners lacked. Central heating, hot water, and electric lighting. Each resident could prepare her own meals at the apartment kitchenette, or as Marie Sulce wrote in her article, she could spare herself the trouble of cooking and take her meal in company, thereby passing a pleasant hour in conversation. That option of served meals in company was offered at the communal dining room in the ground floor, the so-called centrale, which encapsulated this balance between independence and sharing, solitude and community that made the home so successful. A couple of caretakers who lived in an apartment on the ground floor were also available to help with housekeeping and cleaning. 
This affordable combination of individual living situations and communal togetherness and care was the home's ethic. Flexibility was incorporated into the design of the dwellings in the form of the loggia, a colonnaded porch-like room with retractable windows that disappeared into the ledge, allowing each woman to transform the space as desired from a completely open balcony to a sheltered winter garden with a range of variations in between. The loggia integrated those natural elements of light and greenery and air central to Larson's idealized vision of domestic health and happiness. Every inhabitant was also free to select her own decoration. The cooperative worked on the basis of a membership of 200 marks that turned members into shareholders. However, it survived with additional support by donations from professional women's associations and national pension funds that made it possible to maintain the social policy not to increase the membership fee and not to evict struggling women. As a model of domestic independence, but also security, it became an inspiration not only to Winkelmann, who brought a personal interest into the project as herself a single career woman in her late 30s, but also for the creation of sister settlements in Cologne, Hamburg, and Hanover in the same year. In conclusion, and before I open the floor to discussion, uh, I have a couple of notes. I think both these examples can be read as an introduction to a modern domestic project, specifically more as an attempt to signal to German society of the time an expanded public and domestic realm that encompassed this new woman. They acted, of course, as forerunners of apartment design in the decades to follow, but in contrast with later housing projects and housing models, I believe that these radical experiments revealed the possibilities that emerged from social movements, cooperative networks, and collective spatial orders to cater for women's various life phases and styles beyond the role of the wife, the child carer, and the housekeeper. And after all, beyond the nuclear family domesticity that Maria Mies considers an internal colony of patriarchy. And by establishing these links between female emancipation, housing typology, and the commons ideology, I think they highlight the potential of spatial orders to make new social orders conceivable, as Terlinden and von Orten imply also in their um, account of uh, feminism at the time. And, and thus, they, they can help us conceptualize the 21st century feminist discourse and ho housing commons discourse as a joint between uh, historical versatility and contemporary relevance. Thank you very much. Should I stop okay. sharing? I was just about to suggest that so we can see people better. Oh. And yes, thank you very much. That was really interesting. And um, I'm sure there are a couple of questions. And if not, I have definitely some. Um, I would suggest that because we have like almost 40 participants that maybe it's best to raise your virtual hand if you have a question and want to ask a question and then if possible um, switch on your microphone and camera if you are unable to do so um, feel free to post questions in the chat and i can read them out um, for you so i'll try to keep an eye out for hands and um, maybe if i don't see any and anyone else can see them please make me aware of it um, and if not, I just make a start. I just have to like see which one of my uh, questions I will start with. And maybe just a very um, pragmatic one, because you you mentioned that for the, the house and the sun, which I find um, really interesting as a 
just as a as a concept and as a new way of kind of catering for like really this new kind of person in society um I think we actually talked about that when when you presented your research um, in the beginning that I'm quite interested in, in the you mentioned the costs of 200 marks um, to become a shareholder and but have you found out any more about like the is, was there a selection process or did you have to so who decided on who would be able to move in um was there kind of a criteria because you mentioned the educated um woman was that kind of a criteria that you you had to have a certain educational background um was it possible for people for women who weren't really well off to also kind of become part of this community or was it kind of a more established more wealthy environment after all thank you yes these are all um questions um that i must myself had um as, um throughout my research um this the sad part the the sad fact is that um although this this home still exists today not in the form of a, of a women's cooperative i think they're private apartments mm -hmm. but the building exists um the sad fact is that um in 19 42 it was closed and I, I think due to the war certain um, um, archives were burned so mm -hmm. I mean we, we don't actually have much uh, specific information about the women that lived in its first and second phases before the war um, because there was an extension in the in the 20s that the home was very successful mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning it was only 14 apartments and then the central dining room uh, the communal dining room was moved out to a um, auxiliary building in the same site so that more apartments could uh, be developed. Um, so I think the priority was uh, for educated women because of, of course, they were of limited means, but still they could secure, you know, some individual funding. It was not even, I think, a question for other women, I mean, non-educated or not not non working, not professional women to to claim um, single living. Um, I think that the membership was an invention, um, a, a mechanism uh, to welcome, of course, funding. So people could be members even without like with membership to the cooperative, not the actual um, building because the compar the cooperative for women's homesteads built also other projects uh, and was involved with the women's associations and the women's movement so uh, membership was a way to support but um, it turned out it was not enough already in the first years of the project and that's why I mentioned that it got additional support by the women's associations and by national pension funds for uh, female and male teachers. Um, so it started kind of, that was where it started from um, uh, the, the, as a professional group, teachers. Um, and I think uh, it started with the premise of retired professional women who at a certain age cannot, they do not have another solution for housing, but then it invited also working women. So of a younger age. And that's why I mentioned that Emily Winkelmann herself, I mean, she designed something that for herself was, would have been uh, a housing solution. Thank you very much. I see that Lisa Beiswanger put her hand up. So please. Yeah, thank you for this fascinating talk. Um, most of the examples I wasn't familiar with, um, probably everybody else here is. Um, so I have two questions actually. Like one, one is um, if you could say a little more like from your experience researching in this field, um, if you think that this is something like specific for the German context or compared to like Europe, other countries in Europe at the time, um, was there a general 
development. And um, yeah, so this this would be one question. Um, and the other one um, was more about the the competitions um, because you said that at least the House of the Woman was a was a general competition, and I wondered. And, and also you you said that you had the, the thesis that um, um, both examples um, kind of mirrored um, the women's movement that was going on at the at the time. Um, and I, I maybe I, I just missed it and, and you said it, but I was wondering like who had the idea for these competitions and who like wrote the, the competition text. I don't know what it's called in English. Um, and, right. and, and, and and what did the and what did these briefs um, like expect like what would be needed or how did they frame the women who would um, live or work in these houses? Thank you. Um, so about the first question, um, of course there was a framework uh, of women claiming um, voting rights to begin with, and then. Um, rights to, to work, to hold office, to have access to higher education. And then, uh, um, of course, uh, uh, the right to, to um, have access to single uh, living, to, to have uh, other opportunities uh, for housing. Um, uh, from what I've read and I've researched, the, the main um, let's say source of inspiration was the UK at the time, and and the the, the even the women's the, the working women's clubs were inspired by the girls' clubs in London, and also by the suffrage movement there. I guess it was in it was in Paris as well at the same time. Although I haven't I, I, I don't have the research to back that up. Um, but an interesting combination is um, the Garden City movement and, and theory um, emerging at the time and being really successful already a decade earlier um, in Britain, um, which somehow fueled um, what was called the uh, women's settlements in, in Britain and in Germany. Um, so I found in my research that um, uh, the House in the Sun was inspired by women's settlements or women's colonies, as they are referred to, uh, outside uh, London and outside Dresden that were designed according to the Garden City principles. Um, and I should say it's, it's, it's funny uh, how um, other housing movements and initiatives and experiments I have researched, they start mostly from the countryside, not from urban centers, perhaps because land is more available and cheaper there, perhaps it's not as contested as the urban field, I don't know, but um, uh, they started as suburbs, let's say. Um, as for the, then jumping to the second question about the competition, that's that's an interesting question. To be honest, I haven't uh, found the brief in itself, not even for the House of the Woman at the Berkman exhibition. I think partly because at the time still, it will, the discussion is male dominated. The criticism was so harsh. I didn't, I didn't go too deep into that. But even in the official catalog in, in the text that I found about the Bergwin exhibition, um, the, this pavilion is very much downplayed by, by men. Um, they don't even recognize that it, it introduces a new type. They think for whatever novelty or mo modernism it introduces, it's no news. It's part of the Bergwin, um, uh, um let's say discourse or uh, ideology. Um, and I think in the first place, the uh, leading figures of the Werkbund and of the Werkbund exhibition, like uh, uh, Mutesius or Behrens, um, they had some ties with, the, with some of these women, um, either personal ties or they, ha they had collaborated um, or, they, uh, or these women had studied with them, you know, um, in their education. Anyway, it was kind of instrumental to the Verkbund to invite women to, 
as a contribution to the then formative period of, of the principles of, of the design that it put forward. And that is why um, they were very much patronized to fit within that framework that was already set up with this um, um, uh, austerity, the absolute lack of ornamentation and decoration. Um, and actually it was described by many men as masculine um, of <laughs> putting, promoting a new femininity. But so, um, yeah, I'm not really sure how va validated it was after all, because it was um, destroyed very soon. I think it only lived for a year or so, but then it was destroyed. Daniela has a follow-up question, or do you still have a follow-up question? Your hand disappeared. Um, I Actually, I do have. Uh, <laughs> well, go ahead. Th thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jana, uh, for, yes, it was a very, very fascinating and uh, very pertinent discussions. Um, I, actually, I had a similar situation, a similar question on the a line with the Lisa. I could not stop thinking about the UK and the cases and the notions of cooperative and the garden seed movement as well uh, uh, presented. So I think partially was answered that question. But I was wondering exactly. So the uh, one thing was how much your work is also transnational in the sense that tries to mm -hmm. see what were the possibilities of exchange and reverberations between the feminist movement within this movement of uh, of cooperativism and uh, and reform, social reform, and how much. Um, I was wondering how much also in France, this could be also interesting to look at, to see how they were considering the question of, uh, of cooperativism, of, of mutuality, that's what they call there, the association of, uh, of workers in mutual <laughs> exchange and how women were participating. We will see later on, a bit later on in the 20s, uh, figures like, um, Charlotte Perrin, who are going to uh, strongly participate and not via the so-called architecture, but interior architecture and design as you're entering. So I, I was just wondering, this is one, you don't have to answer that. It was just that I could not stop thinking of this uh, transnational connections to see how, how were the efforts and how further these movements could go considering the conditions of possibilities. No? The question I, I would have um, a follow-up is um, I see that the challenge of finding the source and the careful attention to words, no? as you show uh, a testimony or a, a paper where showing like shared domesticity. So how these terms and this language is already appearing I would love if you could elaborate a little bit more if what were the words you found that we use nowadays as a, when we want to talk about gender studies, but at that time they were already in use. How was this language? And I was wondering uh, another question. Did you look at the congresses? Uh, I mean, if the so-called professional congresses, uh, how besides the, the, the Deutsche Werkbund Expo, were there other, let's say, platforms uh, in which this type of issue was raised or how women participated? So something that in the late 20s might have appeared, but I was wondering for this period, if, encounter, if you encountered a, any um, material or something that was worthwhile to, to bring as a, as a source. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Well, a comment to the first part, uh, because I wish I could do the same uh, research in France, uh, if only I knew, I, I, I read French, I, I'm not uh, very literate in, in that sense, so, uh, but I'm sure, um, I, I mean, because as I said, this, this, um, how, the, this new housing need builds upon the new uh, figure of women, of women that emerges at the time. And I'm pretty sure that the writings of uh, Simone de Beauvoir or um, such philosophers at the time, um, of course, 
would have helped at least at, to 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 um, draw a framework for the emancipate and encourage the emancipation of women first in in the profession a way to become to be able to sustain themselves and then to find uh, a different type of accommodation. Um, uh, there's a funny anecdote uh, about a woman in the, the suffrage movement in the UK who held um, a, a, a horn and would uh, make um, noise over uh, Churchill's uh, uh, public uh, talks uh, because she couldn't uh, she couldn't uh, uh, listen to <laughs> to to him anymore, and so she was arrested eventually. But uh, she she. She wouldn't allow his his uh, talks to be heard. Um, anyway, ab about the 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 question. Yes, your comment on the words. Um, I think I found the word genossenschaft in most of the text, and even to be claimed as as a housing typology uh, for the time. Um, and I I. I do think it's it's uh, that's why I isolated this passage of this text about the house in the sun uh, because it condenses all the the female claims at the time how women even if they make it out in the profession at some point in their life they need to retire and still there is no place for them there's no option outside of a family context um, and. Even if they could afford single living, then it would be too solitary, too lonely. Um, and that's why I think the enabling framework is what you said, cooperativism, or what I call the commons. Um, because I think it's very important to understand how some of the most radical or the most successful initiatives um, were the result of um, of uh, coming to get of women coming together in social movements in cooperative networks um, and and strengthen them themselves as uh, their claims and be able to to put them out there and make themselves heard. That was <laughs> a really hard task at at the moment. And I think, yes, um, the women's associations, they, they had a strong presence in Berlin with public events like conferences. And I think some of the, not I'm sure, some of the, of the feminist newspapers um, re-emerged re or continued throughout the 20s. Um, only the, the discourse after the war had already changed a bit and shifted, as I mentioned, towards the end, towards, again, the nuclear family type, uh, because there was a pressing housing need after the First World War. And um, the type that was mass produced in the industry was not that of uh, uh, collective living for women, for single women, it was that of of the nuclear family apartment type. And although there were efforts like the Frankfurt kitchen, uh, they were still promoting, they were within a different framework, not that of collectivity or solidarity, um, or as you said, mutuality among women. It was another context. It just a, a follow up. This is wonderful, and I think it can be evolved into a um, collective work. What you are initiating, so maybe we can learn from the French experience, from the French scholars themselves. So I think it would be fantastic if you, you know, organize or chair, um, you know, a, a panel or a workshop in which these different types of experience from you know, different contexts. Could could come. That would be a, an excellent uh, an excellent uh, I say experience, and I think we can really learn from each other because, as you said, there are very specific contexts and language, and we have, our, of course, our own limitations. I'm not asking uh, you to know the French thing. I also not aware, but I think it's a 
there is something that we could learn from from them and also from other examples. No, I think that was no, absolutely. That's a brilliant idea. And the the UK has so many examples in terms of um, uh, foundations and organizations to to provide uh, housing for working women. I will move over to a question that was um, posed into the chat from, I hope I pronounce it correctly, Hendrina Patirajavane, um, who says, interesting presentation, thank you. Did you have a comparative research or did you do comparative research between houses planned and built by female and male architects from the same period? And were there any different? And maybe I can just um, jump on that question or just follow up with something I would have asked or would have wanted to ask, which is probably making that a little more precise because I was thinking about um, like housing for like Ledigen Wohnheimer for male um, single men. Um, and um, if you could maybe, if you have any done any research on that, and if I was just interesting, do they, for example, also have like a kitchenette? Is that something that's like supposed or where, where it was assumed well women would cook for themselves and they would have that need for um, some sort of companionship um, and if that also ties into like a social perception of women that if they are solitary and if they don't want that that they are more like a spinster um, whereas for men maybe it's also or it was more socially accepted or normalized that they might just not or like remain a bachelor or not be able to find a good woman to marry so if that also kind of um reflected in the architecture um for or alternative architectural project for maybe also single men or living of single men if there were any differences so does that make sense? Thank you. I was <laughs> I was about to say even the opposite. Even for men, it might even be attractive. The eligible bachelor, you know. Um, to be honest, I I haven't looked into men's um, housing. Um, I I just happen to know that there were um, bachelor seats or seats they were called in London, but um, I know there were bachelor apartments even since the 19th century in the US, like in New York for single working men. And in London, I um, I think earlier than the, the turn of the 20th century, um, much uh, earlier. Um, I, also for women, some boarding houses, they were called, but could have been for men as well. Um, so I, I'm not really sure if they had a kitchenette or they would have as these women had in the house in the sun, a couple um, of caretakers, so preparing meals for those who cannot. I think in this quest for, for independence, it, it is important at this time, the experimentation of having both, mm -hmm. like the possibility of preparing something quick when you're not in the mood to mingle with everyone to socialize, um, but also the option of having um, ready-made meals and uh, in, in a communal uh, dining hall. Um, I think that that should be important for both working women and men um, because the reality of a working, of, of a working person is much more burdened than um, than in a different case. Um, it, perhaps it would be important. I I, could, I I didn't think I could fit anything more into the framework of this research. I at the beginning I even um, um, thought of in case I wouldn't find much, um, much material, which was the, uh, not the case, um, that I could carry out a comparative study, let's say, with the next decade and go into depth with the, uh, into a comparison with the Frankfurt kitchen as this uh, transition to a more conservative, again, model of nuclear domesticity. 
where we don't have such, um, let's say, experiments or they were not given perhaps the publicity. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, I, I found so much about the, uh, the, the founding and, and um, the reinforcement of the women's movement in this first decade of the century and then in the 1910s that I thought um, I should focus because the 20s is a much more debated uh, decade uh, uh, in German yeah. architecture, but in general. Yeah, no, it's totally understandable um, to focus just on that. And I mean, I, I don't know much about the layout of those, those leading Wohnheim. It's just like a typology that I came across quite often in research on or in um, architectural periodicals from the 1910s and 20s, where kind of it became something that was designed. It wasn't just something that kind of was or where an existing space was um, used or separated into smaller compartments or um, just like make do, but it was something that was featured and apparently um, had like a was thought through. So um, that was why I was thinking like it would be interesting to see like also how that changed because I think it is like maybe when it became more of a thing to do that there were more like a a way of designing these things whereas in that period that you're looking at it was new and it was something to be explored and to be kind of thought about and to kind of reflect on so what is this new woman in society what does she need and how can we transfer that into architectural spaces or design solutions so I think you're right that there's a and transition Yes, and all the different uh, life phases of a woman. Mm. Uh, because as I said, Emily Winkelmann, once she got involved, really involved with the women's movement, uh, she became like the, as I said, the leading designer of the women's movement. Um, the next year, she was already experienced in more traditional types of buildings, but then she experimented a lot. The next year, she built the, the Victoria Student Halls, very famous uh, type in in Berlin so it was um, female student dormitories mm -hmm. and, and then many many types for all the spectrum of a um, single woman's life um, and the, um, she 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 got a reputation even abroad she was called to build in Austria and and in Switzerland I mean she, um I, I think I, I find it um, impressive uh, within the framework of the time how much um, uh, I, I, um, let's say the, about the radiance of these projects. Yeah, that ties in with what Daniela said. It's actually really interesting to think like how they influence each other, not just in the movements, but really also in the design and in the concepts they adopted and how that again fits or sits into the more general kind of social reformist movements and things like the garden cities or those settlements in the countryside which you mentioned which I think are also I think I'm I mean again it's not my area of expertise but I think that what you said that there's a little more freedom and people they are not kind of in the public eye as much probably um when you have like your village and you kind of set up your little commune, I mean, it's still kind of like that. It was and... also a question of um, um, uh, moving outside the institutional home typology. That was one of the main goals. And because usually institutional homes meant um, uh, like, um, um, usually were translated in typologies um, with no qualities of living space, like dark corridors or small rooms. So I think they turned to the suburbs also as, as a, a way to welcome qualities like um, uh, the green, you know, the sun, the air, um, Winkelmann um, put a lot of her effort in the relationship between the 
the house and the garden around it. She came from a background of um, carpentry enterprise. And so she herself designed the wooden elements, this neat fencing and all the outside uh, pergolas and, 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 and you know, um, in between spaces, playful spaces. Um, and I think at some point even um, women with children were invited. I don't know what was the, the status at the time to be able to have children outside marriage or perhaps we, widowers, I, I don't know, uh, widows. But um, at some point the, the home was very successful. It even had uh, children. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah, they were after she was after many qualities that she tried to invest in her designs um, that do not uh, always fit to an idea we have in mind about an urban mm -hmm. type of cooperative housing. But maybe I follow up with, with one more question, which gives people uh, a last chance to put their hands up. Uh, because I can't see any at the moment, I think, um, which is maybe um, follows up that that idea of like where the places were located or where this um, house was located. Because so, so have you ever any idea how it was received by like the neighbors or the public, or I was thinking like more the local press because the material you showed was more like in my in architectural. Um, publications it was obviously um recognized but was there something like oh look at this uh those women folk living by themselves um without any guardians uh here in Potsdam uh, something like that or has that been really unnoticed or established enough to be left alone sort of mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good question. I would say that all these uh, feminist newspapers, they were not um, genuinely architectural, you know, um, it was not architectural press or orientated towards architectural, purely architectural discourse and critique. So I think um, they, they came up with this um, broader domain, which they called, um, uh, this Gesamte Frauenleben, so all the whole, uh, whatever applies to any aspect of the life of a woman uh, should be recognized and should be given space. And so I think, yes, there were many, many cheerful articles, uh, of course, in the, in the newspaper, in the Gazette that was published by the uh, Pestalozzi Frobel House, this, mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, women cheered there exactly about how independent women live there and uh, what a model of, of uh, happy domesticity. And of course, they also reported the struggles, the, the financial struggles of the cooperative, mm -hmm. but perhaps that was also part of a, of a solidarity that helped find solutions, you know, called for the support of women's associations. Um, yeah, I think I think this is also um, an aspect of of this uh, collective spirit of the, this this group of of newspapers, and they were a, a lot. I mean, I was impressed about the 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 material I found. They um, constantly published articles that talked about um, how this new living culture should be, you know, um, enriched and what are the needs that are not met yet and strive to, yes, to, to, to publish all aspects, uh, uh, advertisements about, uh, about um, available housing, about uh, jobs for women, yeah, I think it was very encouraging. Yeah, but so you don't, you haven't looked into like the local uh, newspaper or, I mean, I'm not sure if there was any in kind of the suburb of Potsdam where that was. 
because that yeah. was I didn't find any um local besides the one that but but the the um the let's say the headquarters of uh of the organization they it, they were not okay. in Boston they were in Berlin and in fact Winkelmann designed the headquarters of the Listen Club the women's organization mm -hmm. that held the exhibition of 1912 and um did many projects uh, most of them were in Berlin uh, and still are today the actually these these homes these headquarters are today's archives okay so they are in in neighborhoods um of Berlin not really in Potsdam but I went to Potsdam there's the um what is called the um the service for the monument protection mm -hmm. Uh, the Denkmal Flege mm -hmm. thing is uh, this holds the archives, uh, the original drawings uh, of the project by Winkelmann. Um, but that's that they don't hold any any archive of, of publications. Okay. It's just um, the drawings and some postcards. It's it's interesting how at this point in time, um, architecture was <laughs> very much um on 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 post stamps mm -hmm. so actually most of the, of the pictures of the building they come from stamps <laughs> so i guess that perhaps it might have been the official potsdam stamp <laughs> i'm not an expert at, in any way on stamps or postage <laughs> Um, there's one question by Frederike who uh, can't really talk because uh, she's got a really bad cold, so I just read it out. Could you tell us something about the political positioning of these women, the architects, but also those working for the associations? Were they left wing or liberal or did politics did not play a role? Mm, that's an interesting question. Uh, the closest I, I got to their political let's say positioning is about this um uh this congress they held in the, the the women's associations came together because it was like a federation around germany in many cities and they came together and held that congress in berlin so i think i read in this article that there were discussions about forming a political party or claiming their way into the parliament but then i didn't follow very much this this um yeah this implication to to see if they actually um managed to do something um i all i know is that they were very active or let's say they, they introduced um a sort of activism political activism in the city um, but again, um, I, they were not really allowed to go outright with that. Um, but through undertakings such as conferences, exhibitions, art fairs, uh, not really outright as, a, uh, let's say, as a political talk or as a um, as a demonstration, although there were um, demonstrations, but not as many as in London, for example. I could also imagine that, I mean, the social reformist movement, it was quite, I mean, people kind of diverted into different directions than following the the war, the First World War, where many who were like in the 1910s still like about social reforms um, that they that turned into a very strong nationalist agenda. Um, so that at this point in time, maybe it was not quite as easy to to separate that or to kind of distinguish that, like looking at the material to say, like, were they more liberal or um, already very nationalist, patriotic? Um, maybe it was more like this yeah. one. I don't know. It's it kind of, it was all there, it was more mixed and it was all sort of under this umbrella of reform because those reforms went into different directions ultimately. Yes, I just a guess. What, what it's for sure is that um, when the political situation changed before the second world war, um, they were entirely left out 
if not um, chased uh, uh, by the nationalist agenda. Mm. And that's why all feminist press was shut down in 1933, most of them. Um, that, that is for sure. Um, so the nationalist agenda in general that was in favor of the family was not really in favor of the mm. feminist movement. Um, that I know for sure. But before that, um, yeah, I I cannot really answer. I mean, I haven't researched that. Me neither. Well, I don't really see any more hands and it's half past seven. So I think people are getting tired after a long day and it's Monday. Um, so thank you very much again, Jana. It was really interesting um, presentation and I think a really interesting discussion as well. And what's left for me to say is that the next CCSA talk will be on the 6th of December, a little earlier than usual at 5.30 and it's going to be in German. Um, and it's on the book Concept Campus and we... We'll have Tom Holat, Amalia Barbosa, and Markus Daus as um, guests or as presenters of the book. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it for tonight.